Hey, everyone. Thanks for joining me again on another of my podcasts. Uh, this is Jeff Palmer, the CEO and founder of Clean Machine. And uh, today we're going to be talking about protein. Uh, so, you know, I became vegan 35 years ago. And uh, obviously, just like today, still, unfortunately, uh, the very first question people ask of uh, someone who's gone uh, uh, vegetarian or vegan is where do you get your protein? And it's it's really funny because um, actually the answer is the same for everyone. Uh, we all, everybody, gets our protein from plants. Now a little bit of protein does come from the breakdown of bacteria, but seriously, do we any of you out there sit down to a nice big bowl of bacteria for breakfast? No, of course not. That's not food. So for our food sources, all protein originates in plants. Okay, so wait a minute, you're saying that animals don't make protein? That animals can consume protein, break it down and reform it, but they actually can't create the essential amino acids that are part of protein, that build all protein chains. Yes, there's proteins that contain other amino acids, but they're non-essential. Basically, our body can reform those out of essential amino acids. So the essential amino acids are exactly what they mean. They're essential. We have to get them from food. Just like all other animals on the planet, we have to get them from food because animals don't make protein. So all that chicken, all that fish, all the eggs, all that, that that is actually originally plant-made essential amino acids. So the big question then is, well, if all essential amino acids come from plants, why aren't we just getting our essential amino acids from the plants themselves? Instead of taking the essential amino acids, feeding them to an animal, and then killing the animal, and then stealing its plant nutrients. That doesn't make any sense at all. We don't have to include that middle animal. Uh, we don't have to cause all that suffering. We don't have to cause that degradation to our environment. We don't have to cause that uh, that ill health that we take on when we take on those animal proteins. Which leads me to number two. Well, it's a protein. All proteins are the same, aren't they? No, they're not. So the first myth <laughs> that I want to get debunked, buried, killed, and put back in the ground where it belongs because it doesn't exist. And that's the complete protein myth. Oh, wait a minute. Plant proteins aren't complete proteins. Please, let's stop this. It's not true. Do some Google, <laughs> Google homework and find out for yourself. All plants are complete proteins. The, the, the reason we got this idea that somehow plants are inferior to animal proteins, and they're not, they're just the opposite, they're actually superior to animal proteins, and I'll explain. But the reason that we thought they were is because we were assuming, hey, animal proteins are higher in these specific amino acids. Okay, that's fine. But is that a good thing or is it a bad thing? that's where we get into the amino acid profiles. If you look at animal proteins, they have different levels of each one of the amino acids. The whole one is called the uh, amino acid profile. So what you want to look at is which of those amino acids actually mirror what our body needs. And when you look at them, you find something pretty interesting that pops out. Two things. One, the branch chain amino acids, specifically leucine, is a lot higher in animal protein, specifically things like whey protein or egg protein. And why is that? What is milk? It is fed to a cow so that a cow can go from 60 pounds to 600 pounds. Now, I don't know too many of you out there that probably want to gain 600 pounds or not, but if you do, that's an ideal food source for gaining 600 pounds. So you need a lot of leucine to stimulate a lot of muscle growth. What happens when you don't need that much leucine to stimulate muscle growth? Well, what happens is that stimulates cells to grow and you say, grow, 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 grow. And the cell goes, I don't need to grow. We're an adult human being. We're good. I need a little bit for muscle protein synthesis for workouts or whatever, but I don't need all that excess leucine. And research recently found that 
we have a leucine threshold. Basically, we get enough leucine and it maximally stimulates the muscle growth that we need for exercise, for muscle turnover. Uh, remember, proteins are not just used in muscle. Proteins are used for skin, for hair, for fingernails. Proteins are used in, in uh, connective tissues. Uh, amino acids are used in connective tissues. They're used in uh, neurotransmitters. There are enzymes. Enzymes are protein. DNA, DNA is protein. So there's tons of reasons why our body needs sufficient amounts of protein. But what we don't need is superfluous amounts of certain amino acids. And that's why milk proteins, cow's milk protein, is made perfectly for a cow so that it can go that 600 pound, that you know, 100 times increase, a 10 times increase in its weight and size. We don't need to be, you know, that. We don't need that. We have human milk that from age, you know, zero to two, we should be consuming. And that has the appropriate levels of amino acids for our bodies, not for a cow's body. We don't look anything like a cow. <laughs> and again, I don't think you want to be 600 pounds. That's what that milk is made for eggs what are eggs made for eggs are are a beginning of a full chicken so that protein has to grow into a full chicken and that's what it's needed for to give that chick a baby that baby bird a head start do we need all that protein no because we're not going to grow a whole new chicken in ourselves um so that's what we're looking at is the amino acid profile so what is the difference between the amino acid profiles in animal proteins versus uh, plant proteins. Besides the branch chains, which I just mentioned, one of the other key things that is a lot higher in uh, animal proteins is two sulfur amino acids called methionine and cysteine. Now, I want you to Google search methionine-dependent cancers. Methionine actually can feed up to 16 to 19 different cancer cells, including breast cancer, prostate cancer, some of the biggest cancer killers of uh, Americans in the United States. And why? Because we're eating too many animal proteins. And these are actually feeding cancer cell growth. So if you want to grow cells that are called cancer cells, make a real high methionine diet and you'll do just exactly that. You'll feed those cancers. Now, if you want to feed human cells, you want to actually lower amount of methionine and cysteine. So we were under the assumption that animal proteins were superior because they were higher in these amino acids when we actually now know that it's healthier if they're lower in those essential amino acids. That's the proper amount. So this whole incomplete protein was was a whole myth that was based on bad information that somehow these animal proteins, just because they were higher in certain amino acids, were better when they're actually causing harm because they're higher in those essential amino acids and, and, and non-essential amino acids. If you look at the way animal proteins are metabolized in the gut, you're going to find something also very interesting, that animal proteins can metabolize in up increase a metabolite when you break down those proteins it produces a metabolite in our gut through the digestion process called tmaos i want you to look that one up too tmaos have been directly associated now and are now actually looking at a greater link to causality a greater association with risk for heart attacks and strokes than even cholesterol so TMAOs could be even more dangerous or better linked to see if we're gonna get cancer or heart attacks rather. So you're gonna, with the, that excess methionine, that excess leucine that our bodies don't need, you can overstimulate the growth of cancer cells, even IGF-1s. Now, what happens when you eat plant proteins? Lower in methionine, lower in cysteine. These are two sulfur bound amino acids. Type in sulfur amino acids too. You're gonna to find some interesting data on there. Now we do need some. Sulfur is important for our body function, uh, but too much is not a good thing. So I don't wanna make any one of these amino acids bad. It's about levels. It's about, is that too much? And if that's too much, is it causing or had the potential to cause negative effects in the human body? So now that we've looked at methionine, let's look at cysteine, one of the other ones that is high in, uh, usually higher in animal products than most plant products. Cysteine can break down into a, another molecule called homocysteine. Homocysteine can actually damage our arterial lining. 
Now, when we damage or scarify, scratch up, we can actually make that a rough surface for placking to begin. Placking can lead to heart attacks and strokes, and you can see the snowball effect here. When you're damaging the arteries, it can cause artery stiffness. When you've got it all scratched up and scarred, it can't stretch. It's not as elastic. It's not as healthy or dynamic as it should be. And when that hardening of the arteries happens, then you've got high blood pressure. Once you stress, the arteries can't expand to allow more blood flow. And that's where that high blood pressure comes in. And that is actually the number one health issue in the United States. So plants actually have things to help reduce blood pressure, help expand the blood vessels, help uh, uh, quench those free radical oxygen uh, molecules that can actually damage the interior of our arteries. So again, you find that animal proteins high in uh, certain amino acids that can actually have damaging and disease causing effects. Plant proteins, on the other hand, high in fiber, high in antioxidants, high in the things that actually protect and heal the body and lower in those uh, uh, amino acids that our body doesn't really need, or if in excess amounts could actually uh, lead to health problems. So now you see the big difference. Here was an interesting study to back up this whole idea. Uh, they took a uh, uh, there was two different groups that they looked at, and they looked at the highest quartile, the, the ones consuming the most amount of protein. So it's even amounts, animal protein and plant protein. And they looked at those two groups and they said, okay, with the people eating the highest amount, how is their risk for heart attacks uh, or, or all disease states? Um, all cause mortality, which is all the disease states together, heart attack, stroke, diabetes, all the big ones. And it says, look at all, all cause mortality, 75% increase from the highest ones compared to the ones that are lower. Wow, that's a big risk you're taking on just by consuming high amounts of animal proteins. And then they looked at cancer, 400% increase in risk for cancer and deaths caused by cancer four times as much risk for dying of cancer just by consuming high amounts of animal proteins. Well, they said, well, then we'll probably see the same thing with the plant proteins because it's the same level. Gram for gram, 250, 300 grams of protein per day, high amounts of protein. Gram for gram the same, then this should have the same negative effects. No, it didn't. As a matter of fact, it was almost no difference in those eating lower amounts of protein. So why is that? Well, if it was the IGF-1, we talk about IGF-1, like animal proteins increase IGF-1, but plant proteins don't seem to do that as much, even at the same gram for gram level. Why is that? It's because those plants have fibers, have polyphenols, have phytonutrients in them that actually can act as binders to IGF-1, stabilizing, leveling, and giving you optimal levels of IGF-1 for your body's needs, for muscle growth, for overall health, for cell turnover, for renewing new cells and rebuilding new cells. All that is important. So IGF-1 is not a bad guy. Our body produces it for a good reason. It's because we need it. We need it for proper cell growth and healthy cell growth. What we don't want is levels so high that it overstimulates cells and can lead to bad cell growth, like in tumors or cancer. So you have a big difference, not only in what's in the animal proteins compared to what the plant proteins have in them, it's how they are digested and, and evolved in our digestive tract with TMAOs in, in animal proteins and not found in, in the plant proteins. You know, you've got a big difference in the way it affects our microbiome. Animal proteins create a bile environment where bad bacteria can come and create disease states like leaky gut and, and IBS and, and, and things like this. These are directly related to our uh, food intake, our food choices. So if I'm telling you you can get the exact same amount of protein, the exact same source, it all comes from plants, and the exact same muscle building effects in either of these groups, but one of them has a potential for high risk of heart attack, strokes, all the disease states, all the nasties, as all the negative effects on our microbiome, all the negative effects on our health, all the inflammatory effects. And remember, inflammation is the precursor to heart attacks, strokes, diabetes, 
all of these are pro-inflammatory conditions. And the more animal products, more you are creating an inflammatory environment. But what do plants have in them? Anti-inflammatory conditions. These antioxidants and phytonutrients and polyphenols, these are rich with anti-inflammatory omega-3s that are in the plants. This is, wh this is why there is such a dramatic difference between a high amount of plant protein and a high amount of animal protein and why there's such a stark difference in their impact on our overall health. Now, quality of protein. So digestibility, let's look at that. So, um, you know, most people considered whey the gold standard for digestibility, but it's not just about how much of that protein you consume, it's how much you actually digest and metabolize. Well, if you are consuming an animal protein and then your bile wrecks up and bad bacteria thrive in bile and they and bile, uh, uh, good bacteria or good probiotics can't live in bile. So you're creating an environment where bad bacteria can flourish and good bacteria start to starve out. Remember, the good bacteria feed almost exclusively on fiber and polysaccharides. Where do they come from? Plants. Animals don't have any fiber at all, zero. No animal product at all has fiber. No eggs, no fish, no dairy, no pork, no meat, no nothing, zero fiber. All the fiber comes from plants. If we need that for our gut so that our gut can break down these nutrients and allow the nutrients to be absorbed and metabolized properly, what do you think the better source of protein is? The ones that have lots of fiber in them. And that's why I, you know, when I, uh the 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 plant-based proteins that are out there i said look somebody has to do a better job at this because what most of the plant proteins available do is they isolate out the proteins so they take a plant like pea rice hemp or soy and then they just take out the protein right it's an isolated protein and that's all you get all that fiber all the phytonutrients antioxidants your vitamins your your omega-3s thrown out and then they add a sprinkling of synthetic vitamins and stuff like that. And that's all you're getting. The body cannot exist on just protein. That's not how muscle is built. Muscle, muscle building, muscle protein synthesis requires EPA and omega-3. It requires the body to have supportive micronutrients and allow that metabolism to happen, B vitamins, things like this. So you can't just say, I'm adding the protein and that gets to build a muscle. That is not how the body works at all. You need whole foods. You need all that nutrition that's already prepackaged in nature, just the way. So I wanted to do something different. I wanted to get back to where we should be with our proteins. And that is using the whole plant, all of the nutrition. And that's why I brought forth lentine. One, it was the highest source of plant protein available out of the market, higher than pea, rice, hemp, soy, and it's essential amino acids and branch chain amino acids. That means more building blocks for you to build muscle to replenish your workouts. Now, that means you can also use less of the protein because one, it's highly absorbed with a PDCAS. That's a protein digestibility corrected amino acid score. PDCAS is very important because that's how much of your body can actually break down that protein and utilize it. We went even a step further and added prohydrolase to it. So it breaks down that protein almost completely. That means you don't have to use a 40, 50 grams of protein in order to get 30 grams into your bloodstream, you're getting close to 100% of that protein that you're taking. You can use less protein, which is better on your eliminatory organs. You can use, um, you can get the same body muscle building effects out of it too. And you're not risking yourself of overstimulating the cells with too much protein. So you're getting quality protein, you're getting the efficiency of the protein, and you're getting all those nutrients, the micronutrients, the vitamins and minerals, the fiber, seven grams of fiber, over 50% of your omega-3s in a single scoop, all those vitamins and minerals, rich in antioxidants, polyphenol, lutein to protect the brain. This is how protein should be consumed. If you're serious about your health and your fitness, not one or the other, don't jeopardize your health uh, by taking isolated proteins. Now, we do put a little bit of isolated protein, which is pea protein, in there to blend it because the, <laughs> the lentin is so rich in nutrients and, and polyphenols and chlorophyll and things like this would be very detoxifying. 
and it's so high in fiber, seven grams of fiber, that's a third of your whole day's worth of fiber in a single scoop. So if you're using one and a half scoops or something like this, you're getting 50% of all your fiber intake for the entire day in one little shake. That might be a little too much for people. So I did have to put a little bit of protein in there to make sure it's balanced out a little bit. But when you're combining it with whole foods, that's when you can get all of the benefits of the whole foods. An interesting study on oil, for an example. Uh, they did a study on oil by consuming oil by itself, and it oxidized in the system, isolated oils, because that's what oils are. They're an isolated fat from a plant or animal. And when you isolate them, it can tend to oxidize. But when you get them in their whole food state, they're wrapped with antioxidants, so you don't have that uh, oxidation happening. But they said, well, well, wait a minute. If that's the case with whole foods and you're getting oils wrapped in antioxidants, and that's what protects them from oxidizing compared to isolated ones, what would happen if you just put the oil on a salad, for example, a nice raw thing with lots of antioxidants in it and consumed it at the same time? They found very little oxidation of the oils because of that. So it's not just about, oh, no oils, don't do oils. I don't believe that personally. I know there's a lot of doctors out there who feel otherwise, and I respect that. But what, when looking at the research, what we I feel the big takeaway is, if you're going to consume oils, consume them with plant-based, especially raw plant-based ones that are high in antioxidants and high in phytonutrients. And this will uh, actually um, offset most of the negative effects that we're seeing. And, and the research bears this out. That's not just me talking. But when you can get them in their whole food state, even better, you know? And that's what's so amazing about lentine and this plant. Um, so that's a lot of what we walked through. You know, IGF-1 was a big thing that a lot of the, especially the vegan doctors were talking about saying, oh, you shouldn't be consuming high amounts of protein because it raises insulin and IGF-1. Okay, let's look at it in context. Um, one, uh, IFG, IGF-1, yes, at high levels is not such a great thing. But what they found in vegans and vegetarians, especially vegans, is that the IGF-1 ended up being bound. That's right. So when you bind a hormone, just like sex hormone, uh, uh, sex hormone binding globulin <laughs> is higher in, in uh, vegans, right? Uh, so what happens is these are self-regulating mechanisms that the body, if the body ever gets too high in a hormone, the body will actually attach just different binding globulins, different fibers, things like this binding agents to help reduce and mediate, regulate these uh, hormones so that they don't get out of balance. Vegans, because of the high plant protein, high uh, consumption of plant nutrients, if you're getting plants in their whole food state, are going to offset some of this. So you don't have to worry about it. That's why that study showed, even though it was really high plant protein consumption, they saw almost no increased levels of, of uh, risk for heart attacks or strokes or all cause death. Actually, another follow-up study showed that consuming plant proteins actually lowered your risk for diabetes, heart attack, and stroke. So that's amazing that that's how powerful the nutrients are that are in the plants when you're not just isolating the proteins. So if you are going to consume an isolated protein out there, and uh, then it's good to actually consume them with other whole food nutrients. So it helps offset some of that that you're getting. And, and that's exactly what we did with, with clean green protein. Um, now, one of the uh, common proteins that are out there to use, and I wanna address this because I think it's important, is rice proteins. So the most common combination out there is pea and rice protein. Uh, I think the world of pea protein, it's, uh, it's uh, non-acid forming, uh, it's generally non-allergenic, um, uh, um, generally non-GMO. Um, so those are all good things. Rice protein, not my favorite. Uh, and here's uh, two of the main reasons why. Um, rice protein is, uh, and, and just type this in. Don't, you don't have to take my word for it. Type in rice proteins and uh, CO2. So the cultivation of rice proteins actually contributes to the largest amount of CO2 contribution of any crop. Uh, in the major food uh, supplying sector. Uh, because they're grown in swampy type things where the plants are constantly breaking down, they're releasing carbon dioxide. And so 
using rice protein is actually contributing to greenhouse gases, CO2 gases, more than any other food crop. That's why I won't use it in any of our proteins. Um, why I don't purchase it personally either. Now, yes, I eat rice and, and I think whole grain rice is, is good, but in moderation. Uh, what I don't want to contribute to is the, the influx or adding more of that uh, when it's not necessary. The second reason is most of the rice is grown in uh, China, unfortunately, where the regulations on the smokestacks out there, the manufacturing pumps out huge amounts of from burning trash and things like this, huge amounts of heavy metals. Those heavy metals rain down and actually get absorbed into the plant, especially rice. Rice absorbs those. Now, normally in nature, that would be a good thing. The rice pulls up those toxic heavy metals and then decays and returns them and puts them back into the ground where they belong, detoxifying the air. Unfortunately, as we're growing them, it's absorbing up all those things. Remember that plant's sitting in water there and it's absorbing up all those uh, heavy metals. And, and that's a big issue. That's why some of the proteins out there tested the highest in there because they have really high amounts of cheap Chinese rice protein out there. And again, that's another major reason why I'll never use rice proteins out there. The heavy metal content and the, the impact on that. Now, here's one of the reasons why I love lentine. One, it is a contaminant free because it's grown in ponds that are completely controlled. Everything that goes into water is controlled. Um, so it just gets the nutrients it needs, no heavy metals. It is one of the few plant proteins on the market actually tested and compliant for CGMP for heavy metals, as well as Prop 65. And that's California's much stricter regulations for heavy metal content. Most of the proteins on the market don't pass heavy metals for Prop 65. And I'm proud of that. I'm proud that, you know, I want to be clean, natural. I want to give people the absolute best in the protein category. So it's whole food. It's easily digested, highly assemblable, especially with the prohydrolase in it, highly nutrient dense. It's rich in things like lutein. So most people hear about lutein and they go, oh, that's good for the eyes, especially uh, protecting against blue uh, light radiation, which we are, are looking at our computers, our phones, our television screens. So it's great to have that. But what we didn't know up until recently is that our body actually soaks up lutein and stores it in our brain. It wraps our neurons with it and protects it. It uses lutein as a neuroprotective. So cool that the studies showed when they looked at cadavers, they looked at people who had died and they did autopsies on them, they found the people with the highest amount of stored lutein had almost no incidence of senile dementia, of, of, of brain IQ, had a larger gray matter mass. That's great, keeping more of your brain over time. I'm all for that one. And almost no incidence of Alzheimer's. And it's interesting when we even looked at infants, babies just coming out of the womb, Babies preferentially soak up lutein out of all the carotenoids. It really preferred soaking up uh, lutein because it wanted to protect the child's brain. Up to 60% of all the carotenoids coming into the child were lutein. And that's because the mother, all the nutrients were going right to the child, helping protect that child's brain. And the cool thing is we store that lutein in our brain for a lifetime. So the more you're eating lutein, the more you're storing it in the brain, the more you're protecting your brain so you have a nice long life without your brain deteriorating from horrible disease states. I'm all for that. When I can do a protein that gives me 50, over 50% 50 of my omega-3s for joint health, heart health, brain health, gives me all the fiber, 6%, 32% of your fiber, feeding my gut bacteria, making me healthy inside and out, plus all that protein, easily digested, low in methionine and cysteine. This is the types of protein that I wanna give because I believe when you are the healthiest, you're gonna be the happiest and you're gonna tell other people. I, I Look, our, my ingredients cost 10, four to five, 10 times more expensive than most of the cheap ingredients that people are getting from China and putting in their products right now in their proteins. I want you to get the best. So I put all that money into the product. It means I don't make so much money on the product and I can't spend a lot of money going out there advertising millions of dollars because I have huge profit margins.
I just can't do it. But what I'm trying to depend on is you appreciating what I've done to put in that product and you telling other people about what I do to try to make a product that is the absolute best for you, that is absolute best for your health, for the environment and for the animals. And if you believe in that, please share, give me a good review, give, you know, tell people about this because the word of mouth is what I'm depending on. I'm depending on you understanding the benefits of what we put into these products and appreciating that and paying it forward. So my give back to you because I had a huge turnaround in my life and my health improved and I wanna share that with others. So I go out and try to find the absolute best that nature has to offer in the plant kingdom. We were first to market with lentine, the only plant in the market in the plant-based protein market shown to have actual real amounts of bioactive B12. Uh, higher in nutrients, higher in protein than, than the other plants, heavy metal tested. I mean, these are difference makers. The most expensive enzyme in the world for breaking down protein breaks down the, the actual protein peptides that cause gas and bloating. So you don't have those digestive problems that you get from some of the other plant proteins out on the market. These are all the little details, the extra expenses that I put in to the product to help make it the best product for you. And I hope you appreciate that. And, you know, going out and finding the best uh, uh, plant-based omega-3, I want you to tune in next week because I've got a huge, huge announcement to make for the plant-based omega-3 category. This is truly a game changer, and I feel it could save billions of animals of lives. Um, fish oil is a $4.2 billion industry. Now, once again, I'm going to share information with you. Please know that you heard it here first. This is all based on the research. It is not me pontificating. It is actual research. But please make up your own mind on this. And if you feel it resonates with you, please share it. Please pull it forward. And let's get this message out that plants are actually superior to animals for omega-3 nutrition. I know that's going to be hard to believe because you've heard so many things like ALA doesn't convert to DHA, but by like 1% or 3%. It's not true. Once you see this research, you're going to see all of that was based on misinformation, a misunderstanding of the research. I'm going to show you there's two studies out there that show vegans have higher DHA levels than people consuming fish or fish oil, even algae. And I'll tell you why I will never take an algae-based uh, supplement. And you should know this, and I want to share this with you, not because I'm trying to sell any product. You know, personally, I almost don't care. I'd, I'd love to just go around lecturing all over the country and educating people on this because I think information is empowerment. Once you have that information, and I give it to you freely, these Facebook Lives are all free. I want you to have this information, and I want you to challenge me. Hey, if you say, hey, Jeff, what about this study? I want you to bring that to me because I want to give you the best information. And if there's better information out there, I want to share that instead. But that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for the absolute best information that shows that what I knew all along, that a plant-based diet is better for us, better for our health, better for the environment, better for the animals. It has to be the best source. It just fits in the whole equation. You don't have it better for everything. And then, oh, by the way, it's not better for your health. It's, that just doesn't make sense. That, that, that's not the way nature is built. Our bodies, the, these cells have adapted to plants for hundreds of thousands of years. To think that we can just all of a sudden throw this crap in our body and our body is gonna respond appropriately is nonsense. And I think the, the closer we can get back to ideal uh, nutrition. And the reason why I don't just look at food, because one, our food has been wiped of its nutrition, so much so because of what we're doing to the soil, because of what we're doing to GMOs, what we're doing with um, the, all the fertilizers, the chemical fertilizers that make it look nice and green and look healthy, but does it really have the nutrient content? A Rutgers study showed up to a thousand percent more nutrient density in an organically grown uh, piece of fruit compared to another one's. You can even see it under Krillian photography that the plant, the organic plant, is shooting out spikes of energy, blues and reds and oranges, and and the and the uh, 
non-organic uh, piece of fruit. It's just this tiny little blue haze around it. The energy, it's a dead fruit. I mean, instead of a vibrant fruit. It's amazing. The research is out there. I Again, I challenge you not to believe anything I say. <laughs> Go out and, and read it on the social media. But sift through the social media stuff. Sift through the science and try to make a good opinion based on the dearth of information that is out there. Not just one study here or there, because the studies can be misinformation. And look, science is ever changing. Obviously, I'm going to be sharing some new studies on uh, omega-3 metabolism that are going to blow people away. It's going to change the whole dialogue on omega-3 understanding. And that's great. It doesn't mean this piece of information is right forever. No, we're going to find out more information, and that's actually going to supplant all the information that even I may be saying right now. But right now, this is the I'm trying to get the best information available through the research and 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 be able to interpret that for you in a way that makes you want to learn more, makes you want to say, hey, wait a minute, that makes sense. I'm going to look that up for myself and find out. So. Thank you for listening to another episode, and I really hope you can turn in, tune in uh, next week for my big announcement on Omega-3. It is going to radically change what we thought we knew about uh, plant-based Omega-3s, and it's going to tip the scales, and I hope it's going to save billions of uh, lives in the animal kingdom, especially the fish, but across the board, I think this is going to be a huge game changer for omega-3 nutrition. Let's get back to it. Now we know plants have B12. I'll be launching a new vitamin D3, uh, hopefully in the near future, that is actually from a real plant. Not a lichen, not a mushroom, a real flowering true plant. It's going to be one of the very first true plant, the only true plant that is actually totally organic too. So you'll have a nice truly plant sourced organic uh, vitamin D3. So with us all sitting indoors, we definitely need to uh, make sure we're getting proper levels of D3. Now we have a good source of plant-based uh, B12. That's what I'm looking for. Let's find these amazing sources of plants that can deliver the nutrition to meet our body's needs, especially in this stressful environment and uh, produce optimal health and fitness. Thanks for watching. I hope you turn in next week and please share, give us a like, and uh, please leave any questions. If you have any questions, we'll try to get some answers out to you. See you next week.